Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone's still feeling nice and awake after lunch. Um, my name is Paul Thorio. I'm from an Australian consulting firm um, called Stratsec, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, browser ghosting attacks, um, which is really just a sexy title to get me into the conference, and now I'll actually explain to you what I mean by that. A um, bit of it about who I am. Um, I'm a security consultant, uh, which obviously means that I'll do anything for you. If you need me to clean the toilets, if you call it a security project, well, I'll do it for you. Um, but uh, I guess what I enjoy with security is on the application side. I come from a bit of a development background. Um, I always thought I was going to be a developer before I went into security and um, sort of fell in love with it. Um, and most of the development stuff I did before that was in the web. So I've sort of um, always been interested in plugins and browsers and web and that sort of side of things. And um, this has sort of led to the type of research that I've been doing over the last couple of years in um, terms of uh, in the field of plugins. Um, I presented a couple years ago uh, about Flash malware, and then earlier this year I talked about um, a, a malicious um, plugin uh, attacks where you uh, force um, the plugin to prevent, uh, or basically stop the plugin from unloading um, sensitive data. So un unloading the malicious data, um, and and that's basically that was the precursor to this uh, browser ghosting attack that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so when I looked at some plugins in the past, um, basically the most vulnerable plugins that I found were Acrobat, which seemed to be the most um, uh, vulnerable to this. And, and basically the attack works by um, uh, stopping the, the PDF from being unloaded and then trying to do some uh, malicious things after that. Um, basically the 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 way I'm going to break this down is first looking at the persistence, so how you stop it from being unloaded. Um, then looking at uh, communication, so how do you um, then talk from your, you've got this malicious thing sitting in memory, how do, you, how do you talk back to maybe a command server or something like that. And then looking at the functionality that's available um, and what's possible from there. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, Acrobat script injection, that's sort of something I discovered uh, sort of recently, but it's kind of relevant to this whole style of attack because it's another way of getting script running um, within a browser rather than trying to do the persistence thing, but I'll explain all that a bit later. Okay, so browser ghosting. Um, I started looking at this uh, almost 18 months ago. Um, Manuel Caballero did a, a presentation at a Bluehead event um, and it was uh, basically about uh, using JavaScript to that, that sort of prevented itself from being unloaded. Um, I've never actually seen the details of that presentation being a private conference, but there was a bit of discussion on the web about how it was done and that sort of thing. And at the time, I was sort of playing with um, various plugins and um, kind of thought, oh, maybe you could do a similar sort of attack in plugins, sort of make some content that stops itself from being unloaded when it should, and then maybe look at, okay, let's see what you can do from there. Um, so that, that's in essence, I guess, the, what we're trying to do with this attack is. Um, get some sort of content that stops itself from being unloaded, so it's kind of like a ghost. Um, and then uh, the user continues browsing as normal, unaware that the, um, the, the content is still running in the background. And then the attacker then tries to send some command to that ghost um, and maybe try and uh, take advantage of the fact that we're not where we've, uh, like the, the content's still running, but we're not on the same website that we're, where the content was loaded from or, or something like that. Um, Ghost is a pretty apt term, actually, as it turns out, because there's a lot of limitations in, in what you can actually do because of the, the nature of the way that you achieve the persistence, but I'll, I'll go into the details of why that is later on. Anyway, so here's a really, really bad um, diagram, but hopefully this will give you a bit of an idea of what I mean. So first of all, we've got our a.com, which is some website that loads some malicious content. Um, and this is some sort of script that uh, it starts up, and then it prevents itself from being unloaded. Uh, meanwhile, the user continues on and browses to b.com and then to c.com. And then maybe at the time when we're at c.com, then the attacker sends a command to that script, hey, get to the browser, try and view the cookie, or try and launch some sort of, um, maybe some pop-up or something like that, or, or do something to, to get some sort of insecure scenario happening.
Okay, so what are the, some sort of potential attacks that we can do if, if this was possible? Well, um, we can have a, a persistent command and control channel. If we can get that bi-directional communication going between the, the content, then we effectively got so, kind of like a bot sitting on the computer, sitting there waiting for commands. That's kind of cool. Um, maybe we can do some key logging or click monitoring if we can get somehow get access to, to those things. Um, Access, accessing or modifying um, subsequently loaded web pages, maybe steal some data, potentially breaching um, uh, cross-domain policy, that sort of thing. And then um, obviously abusing system resources if we've got a script running on the, um, on the system. We're obviously taking up that user's system resources. We might be able to, you know, we could request web pages, whatever else, um, show ads, something like that. Um, so it's, it's essentially, I guess, a, a Trojan running of the web app layer. Okay, so a bit of the background of, of why, why, I guess, where this came from was um, I noticed in the old version of the Java, Java plugin, it's actually been fixed now, but in the old version of the Java, Java plugin, um, when you navigated away from the page, the Java applet that had been loaded on that page, although it wasn't still shown, um, it, it would still be running in the background. Um, and it only actually closed when the browser was closed. Um, so, I, and, and that's really where the idea came from. Um, so, it's really quite trivial to do. I mean, an infinite loop is really all you need to do. So, if you put that first bit of code, um, the stop uh, function is something you override in an applet. As soon as you call it, it'll just keep printing out stop. So, nothing very exciting, but it shows that the code is still running. Obviously, something more interesting. Um, is to, okay, in stop, instead of just printing something out, we try and go out to a server, get a command, and then um, do something with that command. Um, it also works in destroy, but that's not really the point. The, the point is that the code is still running after the page is gone. Um, so how severe is this attack going to be? Well, it all comes down to, first of all, the persistence. So um, how long can this persistence be maintained? Um, what happens if the victim navigates to a new page? Um, what happens if the victim closes their browser? All of these things, obviously, ideally, it would still be working um, if the victim still closes, if the victim closes their browser. Ideally, that our code will still be running, and I'll show you how, how you can actually do that with PDF. Um, with communication, um, can the attacker set up some sort of communication server and then have some sort of channel sending some commands back and forth? Um, and then what restrictions are there on that? Um, are you going to be bound by certain ports, certain protocols, um, same origin, things like that? So that's, that's really what I've, I've dug into in this, in this talk, in actually building, I guess, a sort of proof of concept um, in, in PDF. Uh, and finally, once it's been uh, ghosted, what can you do with it? OK, so today I'm going to be doing a case study in Acrobat um, and uh, loading a, a a uh, malicious PDF or a PDF that contains a malicious script um, loaded in the Acrobat Reader browser plugin. Um, it is tested in Firefox, Internet Explorer, and Chrome. It doesn't really. There's not really a whole lot of difference between the three, given it's a plugin. But um, uh, it actually works a little bit better um, in Internet Explorer and Chrome, partially because of the way they they deal with threads. Um, Firefox locks up a bit because you're trying to use infinite loops, but um, I'll get into that in some of the demos. Why looking at Acrobat? Um, so I, in the previous talk, I, t I sort of tested um, four main plugins and, and to see if this was even possible. Um, and basically, Acrobat turned out to be the most, well, the worst or the best for an attacker, depending on which way you look at it, but um, certainly the most interesting. Um, Java used to work, um, but obviously it's been patched. And the only thing about Java is that the persistence died as soon as you closed the browser. Um, the thing with Acrobat is you can actually get it to continue to run even after it appears that the, the browser has been closed. Looking if, at the process, you can see the browser process is still running, but um, to the average user, it, it'll look like it's closed. Um, and Flash is invulnerable, and Silverlight eh, might be vulnerable. To be honest, I haven't looked at it heaps. Um, whenever I, I tried this sort of attack, it basically just resulted in the browser locking up completely and not being very useful. Okay, so. Just to go into a bit of a background of um, Acrobat for those who aren't super familiar with the, the details of Acrobat, uh, I'm sorry, PDFs. Um, so PDFs are basically made up of objects which describe pages. Um, 
Some of those objects are actions, some of those actions are JavaScript actions, and I'm going to be mainly talking about JavaScript actions today. There's a whole other swag of um, uh, things in other PDF actions. Um, there's actually, I think it's a talk tomorrow, which uh, should be very interesting about possibly some of the other actions, but um, I'm specifically just going to be looking at JavaScript. Um, so how do you even insert a script into, Java, in, into PDF? Um, Basically, you attach it to an event, um, so something like a document open, page open, page close, something like that, and you do your JavaScript in response to that event. Um, most, if not all of the examples, I think, probably even all of the examples, are created by a framework called Origami by uh, Guillaume Delugre, apologies for pronunciation, and Fred Raynal. Um, Fred's uh, talking tomorrow. Grats, guys, that uh, your framework is awesome and uh, saved me a lot of time. So highly recommend anyone who's interested in this sort of thing checking it out. Um, and also, I've just been attaching the, the scripts to the document open event because I want them to run straight away, basically. A um, bit of background about the um, different types of events you have in JavaScript. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them, but for our purposes, basically, um, we're looking at document events and page level events. Um, so, I, I opening a document or opening a page. Um, the reason why this is important um, is it comes back to basically the permissions that the JavaScript has when it runs um, within uh, Acrobat depend on where the, the context of the event. So um, we're looking at document level events and page level, level events. Now, why are we doing um, this is because they're the ones we have access to as someone sending a malicious PDF. Um, folder level scripts, they're ones that you've got installed on your machine itself. Um, and if you've got access to the machine to copy JavaScript to their computer, you can do a hell of a lot worse things than what I'm talking about today. So it's not as applicable. Um, field level is basically form actions, and it, it has the same privilege as page and document. And batch level uh, are not accessible to um, just a normal document. So, so it's really just document and page level events. Um, so why do we care about this? Um, basically, there's a whole bunch of um, functions within Acrobat that would be really useful for um, trying this sort of attack, but you're not allowed to use them in an Acrobat reader um, because they, they have what in what's called a privilege context. And so this, uh, today I'm not talking about trying to escalate into privilege context. I'm purely talking about what you can actually do within reader by itself. Okay. So first of all, we're talking about persistence. So as I sort of alluded to with the Java example, the persistence is really um, nothing fancy or nothing uh, revolutionary. It's basically just an, an infinite loop. Um, so I've got a simple function here that just pauses for a, a given amount of time, um, which is just a, basically a poor man's sort of thread.sleep or something like that. Um, OK, so another thing for anyone who wants to have a play with um, Acrobat and PDF, um, it's not like Flash where you have um, trace for debugging. Uh, Flash is nice, you've got trace, you can, you can debug to disk, you can see what's going on. In Acrobat, there aren't really anything um, very nice. You have, there is a debugging console which you can enable. The trouble with that is A, it doesn't work when, you've, when you load a PDF within the browser, which is really what we care about. Um, and the other thing is that uh, things like uh, if your program crashes or goes into a lock, you, you, you lose all the debug output. And it's um, and because of the nature of the, um, this type of program, you're popping infinite loops all the time, um, you, you're losing your debug output. So text-to-speech actually provides a really nice um, sort of helpful debug output. Um, and it's kind of cool too, you know. It's a bit like hacking in the movies. You can make your PDFs talk. Um, some other alternatives, if you don't want to use that, you can use global.set persistent to write um, to basically store variables to disk, but um, it didn't really work consistently for me. Sometimes it would write it. Basically, you don't have a flush function, so you can't guarantee that you're, what you're writing will actually get written to disk. Um, a really uh, basic way to do it is also just to use app.launch URL and then log the result. Um, but it's pretty slow because you're popping a browser window every time you want to debug something. And if you're using a browser anyway, you interfere with that. So anyway. Um, does anyone recognize that? Wouldn't expect too many people. Anyway, so this is a puppet from my childhood. I think it's actually an American TV show. But there's this song that we used to sing on the school bus that 
as the name implies, a song that never ends. Um, so that's what I've got as my example today, to show a, a song that never ends. Yeah. I can actually see. Should have worn my glasses. This is the song that never ends. Okay. Yes, it goes so on here we have my friend. a simple some PDF started that plays some songs. Not it was, and they will continue to sing and it we'll close browser. Oh, well, that's not so good. So, well, that's not really a song that, that never ends, obviously. That's just a song that ends. So, not really what we want. Um, but if I link that pause function and I get that to do the singing for me, You'll see. This is the song that never song ends. That never ends. Yes, it goes on and on, my friend. And Some people started we've singing. We've got a browser it, that never closes. It was, so and they will continue singing it for. Okay, well now we've got persistence. That's our first part. Um, we can't yes, get rid of it. Goes on and on, my friend. Um, Some without people killing started it. singing it, not knowing what it was, and they will continue but singing it forever just because there are bees. Is the song that never ends. Yes, it goes on and on, my friend. Uh, Some people started singing it, not knowing what it was, and... Hey, okay, it died anyway. Good. Okay, I had a timer on it too, so... After the given amount of time, it, it finishes the infinite loop and dies. So, okay, that's our first part. We've got, we've got some sort of persistence, but it's not really, I mean, it's not that useful unless, you know, the whole window's hidden, because if the user can just see that the whole process is just sitting there hung, then that's not very, it's not exactly a subtle attack. So I started playing around, and um, turns out that uh, if you're really quick with the mouse, which I'm not going to be with that screen down here and with my touchpad, but if you're really quick, you can uh, get up there and close that, uh, that window before before the JavaScript really kicks in or something, I'm not, not exactly sure what, but basically you end up with the loop running um, and the window not being visible. Um, so now obviously when you're trying to attack a user, you don't have the ability to just control the mouse and you know, close the window, or at least it's not very subtle if they do that. So what we can do... Uh, if I get this right... Okay, I'll just quickly go. So this is the, the, the code for those last two demonstrations. So the, the first one just, just does the song that never ends. The second one starts the song that never ends, and then it just goes into a loop for 30 seconds. And that stops, that's enough to stop the browser from closing. Okay, so the key thing here in, in actually launching a useful attack is um, getting the browser to disappear before um, the PDF locks up that window and you lose and use any sort of interactivity. Um, this can be automated just by using uh, pop-up windows and, and scripting, as it turns out, um, as long as you get the timing right. Um, so you may have to bear with me a little bit, but we'll see how we go. Um, okay, so I've got some website. Click a link, and any luck. I'm still alive. Okay, so we have our. Um, I'm still alive. So here you can see I can still use the browser, and in the I'm background, still alive. obviously I've got my PDF running, and it's uh, going round in a loop. I'm saying, still alive. I'm still alive. Now. I'm still alive. Can't remember exactly how long I set that to loop, but I'm still alive. In the uh, interest of sanity, I'll just kill it. Okay. So, great. Now we have our PDF. It's hidden. It's running in the background. It's chewing up 50% processor, but well, it's not our processor, right? Um, there are a lot of side effects, though, that you have to be careful with in, in trying to get this actually as a stable as attack. Um, because funnily enough, infinite loops cause system instability. Um, a, you've, you've got to get the timing right. Um, you need a new window. Um, pop, like using it in the same window in a, in, in a frame within a window doesn't, doesn't work because it just hogs all this, um, this, the processor. 
Um, another quite an interesting um, uh, byproduct actually is that for the uh, the window that is holding the malicious PDF, um, that Acrobat is is using all the CPU to run that infinite loop that's doing nothing. Um, so if you want to use a lot of the communication plugins and a lot of the communication stuff within PDF is actually not within JavaScript, it's in within separate plugins. For example, the Flash plugin. Um, if you want to use Flash to like talk out and do some funky stuff, um, it won't get, actually get any CPU time to do that. It'll just hang. So um, I'll show you a way you can actually get around that later, but, but it, it, does, um, it, it does prove a bit of annoyance. Um, so now what? Okay, we've got our, our PDF there sitting in the background, taking lots of CPU time. What can we do here? Uh, from here, so we want to, okay, can we make network connections, uh, maybe do some command and control, uh, maybe interact with the host browser. Okay, so I mean, this is pretty simple, similar to previous sort of JavaScript attack frameworks, you know, like your beef, um, XSS shell, browser writer, those sort of things. What we're trying to do is, you know, talk out to a remote HTTP server, get ourselves a command, and then do something from that command. Um, needs to be covert because we've, we've got a hidden window. We don't want to be popping windows all over the place. Um, and it, ideally, it needs to work cross domain because um, depending on how we've loaded this, whether we've loaded it through XSS or we've loaded it from our own browser, we probably want to attack other domains. So ideally, it works cross domain. So how do we do this in PDF? Well, I looked at a lot of different ways. Um, first of all, um, using Acrobat Forms was the most obvious way. Um, in Acrobat, you can do something like uh, this dot submit form, and that will um, send the form data onto example.com. Um, this, you, you can also do some tricky stuff with um, FDF so that when you submit the form, it doesn't cause the, the PDF that's doing the submission to replace itself, because usually the, when the response comes back, it re replaces the page. What I did notice, though, was that the submit form always gets the page to reload the PDF. So that's not really very useful um, in terms of um, our attack, because every, every request, we basically unload ourselves, and, and we lose. Um, uh, you can submit cross-domain with, with uh, submit form, but the user is warned about it. So again, it's, it's not so useful. Um, other two other main functions in, within PDF to make HTTP requests are get URL and app.launch URL. Um, both fairly similar, except, uh, so get URL basically replaces the current window. So that's pretty much out right there because we've lost our PDF that's, that's looping. So. Um, App.launch URL is okay, a bit nicer. Um, we can open a new frame. Um, it's okay, you know, we can open a new frame, but uh, it pops up to the user and then you could make it disappear, but the user will see it, so it's, it's not really very covert. Ideally, what we want is something that makes just a, you know, a silent request back and forth. The other thing with both of those, um, uh, actually, no, not other thing with both of those, we know that. Um, so it, these are more in, in uh, useful basically for our last part when we're trying to interact with users, so pop-up websites, that sort of pop-up phishing sites, um, that sort of thing. But okay, so the next thing, um, when I previously did uh, a talk on this, um, uh, I was talking about web services because this is the easiest way in PDF to um, make a connection out and have it a bi-directional channel. Um, only problem is it only works easily within um, Acrobat Pro. Um, you can actually do it with the uh, Acrobat reader, but the PDF needs to be signed and it needs to have um, form submit privileges. Uh, and basically, in order to do that, you need the um, Adobe Lifecycle ES um, package, or I think you need to come to one of the talks tomorrow, possibly, but uh, I won't give that away. Um, so, yeah, I, it works great, but unless you've got that, you, you can't use it. Um, so well, I thought th there's a whole bunch of other functions within a an Acrobat. Maybe I'll just I'll just find one that um, especially there's a lot of undocumented functions. Surely one of them must just make a request out. So um, well, just to give an example of some of the functions, there's um, some awesome functions like this one, which is a test HS verify email. Um, notable thing S Dakin. So that'd be Scott Dakin, um, developer from. Acrobat Reader, so this is some sort of test function or something that's still sitting in JavaScript. This next one, um, 
It's got S Daken again, Wibbler. So this is all kind of debug code or something that's, I don't know, put in years ago and no one sort of realized to take it out. Go I Googled for Weebler and this was the first thing that came up, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, keep working, guys. Um, so basically what we're doing here, just doing for i in this, get all of the um, functions within the this object. For each one of those functions, okay, if it's a function, call it with a, a URL, see if it makes a connection, and, um, and then if it makes a connection, then hooray, we win. Um, but turns out there's a couple of reasons why this doesn't work so easily. One, um, it crashes all the time when you try and do this. Um, and two, uh, all the functions I did find that actually did make a connection always warned the user um, of the cross-domain attempt. Um, but yeah, there may, be, there may be functions there, but I, I couldn't find any. So anyway, so I turned to um, looking at Flash. And um, uh, basically, you can embed Flash files within um, uh, PDFs. And then you can use uh, the Flash file to do the talking for you um, without, getting, uh, without triggering the, the warning signs to the user. So just I can do this. Firefox might be a bit easier. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. So all I've got here, this is just a simple PHP page that just listens for a, a um, request and then logs it. I've got a cross-domain Flash PDF here. Notice here that this is on c.com, this is on b.com. I load my PDF on b.com. There's a hidden flash file in that, that if we reload this file, you can see it made the request there. And um, so we can reload this a couple times. And we'll see here, we've, so you can see it making the cross-domain request. So we've got a silent cross-domain um, uh, communication channel. Okay, so we've got bidirectional. Um, now, okay, so we've got flash talking, but we would really like to have that data back in PDF so we can do something useful. Um, uh, basically, this is easy to do in PDF. You just set a callback in the flash function um, with, with some name. Um, and then you just do call AS and the function name. So then you can, you can get that data. Sweet, I thought I was totally set. However, turns out that when you're running in an infinite loop, Acrobat hogs all the processor and Flash doesn't get a look in. So your communication channel just kind of hangs there and doesn't make any, um, uh, any communication. There is a way to, to get around this is by popping alerts in the PDF, which um, pauses the JavaScript in the PDF and lets the Flash talk. However, obviously popping alerts isn't the most subtle of things and is probably going to be noticed by the user. So again, this wasn't such a great channel. But luckily, one of my colleagues, uh, Colin Wong, stumbled across this um, little gem. So Acrobat also supports XML um, uh, through the use of an XML data object. You can parse XML. Um, if anyone's familiar with XML, you can define external references within XML. Um, when you parse that XML, that XML parser is going to need to resolve those references. Um, and so basically we've exploited this uh, fact to uh, uh, induce the Acrobat to make a HTTP request. So there's a little sample down there. So we basically uh, define an entity, um, resolve that entity, oh, instantiate that entity, and then uh, Basically, when it gets dereferenced, it makes the request. Um, the great thing about this thing is that it works cross domain, there's no warning, and um, you get the response too because you get the resulting XML document. So, this is perfect for our purposes. So, we can um, go out to a server, it sends something back which is XML, it just gets slotted straight into that document, we read it, and then we have our um, bi directional communication. Okay, so now we have. The first two things um, of our, uh, uh, our goal, we've got our persistence and we've got our um, uh, 
our communication back to our, our, to our controlling server. What can we do from here? Um, so when I, when I first looked at this, I thought, well, if you could keep, get, the, get the, um, the, the script to persist, then, well, you, you're probably going to have a, you know, you, can, you could talk to the browser, steal the cookie, and it would be totally cross-domain and be all great. Turns out it's not quite that simple. Um, because unlike some of the other things like Flash and Java, Acrobat doesn't actually have a nice way of getting back to the browser. Um, I'll go through some of them and, and what does and doesn't work, and I'll explain why. So first of all, you have um, post message, um, which basically you have to set up handlers in both Acrobat and JavaScript, and then you can talk to each other. Um, you have uh, submit form with the JavaScript URL. Um, unfortunately, that, that doesn't work anymore. It's been patched in, in 9.1, so you can't do that anymore. Uh, and, and I also tested, it's not just submit form, pretty much I couldn't get it to work with any JavaScript, any, any function. Um, uh, and so, so that's, that's kind of out. But the, the other way to get data back into PDF is basically just defining it in the URL. But it's not really, it's not really what we want because what we really want is something in Acrobat that can reach out and grab the data from the browser. So um, uh, basically, post message is the only one we can really do that with. Um, so this is basically how you set it up. You set up a message handler that's defined in bold there. And on message, you do something like grab the cookie or whatever. And then you send it back to the PDF. Um, inside the PDF, you have, another, you have a message handler object. And they, then, you, um, then you call this.hostcompainer.postmessage. Um, the problem with this is obviously you need to define some JavaScript in the page that's hosting the PDF, which basically ties that PDF to that page if you're going to do anything useful. So thereby um, removing any sort of advantage you had around you know, just grabbing it and going to a page and, or getting a reference to a window and, and grabbing data out of a window. So that kind of um, pretty much neuters any sort of attack um, towards, directly towards the browser anyway. Um, uh, as I said before, okay, there is this dot submit form, but it's been patched. And if they haven't patched, then well, you could just, you know, there's plenty of command execution bugs in older versions of Acrobat. So if you're going to attack older Acrobat, you may as well just do command execution. <laughs> so talking to the browser, no, nah, not really so possible. Um, how about key logging? That was what the, um, the Calibera attack was talking about, grabbing focus and, and stealing keys and that sort of thing. Um, again, the, not being able to talk back to the browser, like with, with Java, you've got Live Connect, you can just call stuff as long as you've still got access to a valid window object. Um, PDF, you don't have that, so yeah, pretty much out, fortunately. Um, port scanning, though, is certainly possible. Um, wrote, we were a little uh, PDF port scanner. Uh, we used the soap.connect method, so we were obviously doing it in Acrobat Pro, but you could, it works just the same using um, the XML method I was talked about earlier. Basically, you just attempt a connection based on whether it, uh, it fails or it times out or whatever, whatever the error, error message you get back, then you can decide. If it's, it's a rudimentary way. Would you actually do it? Nah, I don't know. It's not that exciting. Um, so not wanting to leave you with kind of, oh, well, we got here, but we didn't really get anything that awesome. I thought I'd talk a little bit about JavaScript injection, because this is sort of something that came out of um, looking at trying uh, ways to try and uh, uh, send data back and forth from PDFs. And just there was some really interesting stuff that, um, that you can do um, with uh, a thing called FDF, which is Forms Data Format. Um, so basically, Acrobat has a mechanism for um, submitting and, and loading data um, uh, called form data format. Um, it's, called, it's pretty much like post for HTTP. You, um, you hit submit and it will send all of the form data encoded in a kind of a semi-binary format. Um, uh, basically, inside that FDF, um, you can specify a target PDF file from, uh, and the data that you want to load into that, tar that target PDF file. The, the point of FDF is basically to pre-populate um, form data. So you could give someone a, a form and it would fill out their, maybe their name and address or something like that for them. Um, but there's no check to ensure that the FDF is loaded um, from the same domain as the PDF. Um, and the other thing is that the target file URL can be a JavaScript URI. And um, I'll just explain how both of these can be, you can do some pretty interesting stuff with that. Um, okay, so, so that's what an FDF file looks like. 
um, really basic one anyway. Um, we have the slash f command, which is specifies the target, which is the PDF to be loaded. And then we have the slash after command, which says, OK, after you've loaded the, the PDF, then um, execute this script. What does that mean? Well, it means you can inject script into Adobe's website, or any PDF for that matter. Um, when I found this, I thought, whoa, this is huge. This is a mad vulnerability. Like, I'm going to get mad creds for this. You know, I emailed Adobe. Um, it turns out this isn't actually anything new. This is actually known. It's documented um, in the uh, Adobe website. Um, basically, they have a thing called enhanced security. Um, you, if you enable enhanced security, it prevents FDF injection. Um, but it, it's not enabled by default. Um, well, OK, so well, you can inject script into a PDF. Big deal. It's not the browser. You don't have the cookie. What? One thing you could possibly do, if you know the exact URL of a PDF, you could steal the contents of that PDF. Um, basically, you send them an FDF file, which has the target PDF, some script that gathers the content, and then sends that content off to somewhere else. Um, the only thing in the, when I tried to do this, um, even the XML channel resulted in a warning to the user. Um, it's a fairly cryptic kind of warning. It just says it's trying to connect to a site. Um, uh, if, if it was a site you trusted, you might say yes anyway. So it's not great either way. But um, if there was another channel, for example, if you were able to maybe do it through DNS exfiltration, you could probably get the data out that way maybe. Um, but more of an impact um, is you can actually do XSS um, uh, through a, a multi-stage, basically, attack. Um, so you, basically, because it doesn't check uh, the file or the, this, the F parameter um, contains JavaScript, or you can use a JavaScript URL there, you can um, use a multi, uh, you, can, you can put in JavaScript now. So if we went back to, where was it? So if I put JavaScript in there and open it up, I'll get JavaScript alert, whatever. Now, that's not great in itself, because obviously you just open a file, you get JavaScript, you get code executing on wherever you loaded that file. However, if we use a multiple stage attack, um, basically uh, we do XSS. So we, we first of all launch our previous FDF like we did before. We open our victim PDF uh, here. So we, first of all, we get our FDF. Then we go and we load our victim PDF. Then we run our code, which submits back to our alert PDF. We get a warning. So damn, we were so close. We almost had XSS. Um, I don't know. Maybe a user clicks yes. Maybe they click no. But nah, it's not so great. What we really want is no warning, which is possible. Um, one of my colleagues, Alex, noticed that um, if you use a redirect, um, you don't get a warning. So basically, with this attack, um, you load the FDF, then you load the victim PDF, and then instead of going straight back to your site with a malicious FDF, you bounce yourself off a redirect on their site, and then you get your, your, JavaScript, your, your FDF that has the JavaScript in it, and then you win. Um, so. The, I guess the implication there is if you have PDF and you have open redirect, you have XSS on your site. Um, not as cool as the FDF bug from a couple of years ago, but still kind of interesting. Um, there's some interesting implications for the ghosting attacks I was talking about. Now, instead of getting someone to load a malicious PDF, we can now inject our malicious script straight into a PDF on any domain. Um, Basically, you don't need to find XSS on the domain to have some script running on the domain. So you, you just uh, you, you load up an FDF file. It then injects that script into a PDF. And then you, could, you can ghost that PDF and do, do exactly the same stuff as I was doing before, but on basically on any domain, um, which is kind of cool. Because it, if you're trying to do an attack, um, some of the things you might be able to do is say you want to do an, an, an attack where you, you've got XSS on a site, but you don't know what a user's logged in. You can use the persistence to keep yourself running in memory until they have logged in. And then you can, then you can trigger the XSS to steal the cookie or something like that. Um, another cool thing about this is it deflects the uh, attention away from the, PD, like the bad FDF file, because it looks like the PDF that's loaded is the one that's actually causing the problems. Um, although I did notice some limitations with using FDF and the sort of persistence stuff. Basically, um, there was 
the XML, cha XML channels I just talked about before will, will have a warning, um, whereas in a normal PDF it won't. Um, and also some strange timing behaviors. Um, sometimes it would make requests, sometimes it would queue them up, that sort of thing. So it's not quite as, as stable. Um, okay, so to summarize, um, basically it's possible to create a PDF which uh, prevents itself from being unloaded uh, by using infinite loops. Um, you can create a command and control channel um, from that PDF, even cross-domain. Um, now, from there, the attacks are somewhat limited in terms of being able to get back to the browser, but there's certainly a lot of other potentials. Um, the fact that you can pop a window is, is pretty useful, especially for someone like advertisers. Um, I, I wouldn't expect this to be used in, in like a typical, uh, I guess, sort of like a, tro uh, a zombie or a botnet type of thing. It's too unstable. It's, um, you know, it, it doesn't last that long. If, if the user notices, they kill the process, that sort of thing. But certainly for um, uh, malicious advertising, you know, you want, you want an ad to stick around and, and get its message out, you know, well, this will do that. So uh, uh, this, this, there's definitely the potential there. And, and obviously, finally, if you've got a PDF and an open redirect, you've got cross-site scripting. Um, what do we do about it? Well, if you're a plugin developer, um, you need to consider timing and loop attacks when designing plugin architecture. I didn't actually see in, uh, any issues in plugins with the timer mechanisms. Um, that's what the, the Calibera attack was, was a um, set timeout um, issue, but uh, that wasn't the case in, in any of the plugins I tested, but certainly the loop attacks are. Um, content shouldn't be allowed to um, consume resources after the parent window is closed. Um, and you need to deal with the problem of runaway scripts. So you, and you've seen this a lot in browsers, like the most recent um, browsers. They've got execution watchdogs to stop scripts um, uh, just from going on as long as they like. Um, for the end users, um, fix any open redirects. Um, any domain that has open redirects and PDFs has XSS, as I said. Um, this isn't related to, to Acrobat, but certainly if you haven't already updated to the Java 2 plugin, um, because it completely prevents this sort of attack, um, it, it all cleans itself up nicely after the page is closed. Um, certainly strongly recommend that you harden your Acrobat um, installation. Disable Acrobat JavaScript if you don't need it. If you're just using it to view PDFs, maybe you don't need JavaScript enabled. Um, certainly um, uh, the enhanced security mode, uh, I'd, Strongly recommend turning that on because um, it prevents it completely prevents the FDF injection. Um, you can also block access to the internet from PDFs, so you can stop PDFs from talking out to the internet. That's an op a security option within Reader. That's certainly another thing I'd recommend. And um, another thing you can do, which it kind of mitigates the attack somewhat, is basically set uh, Acrobat to open um, PDFs in a separate window. Instead of opening them within the browser, you can force it to download and, and open within the browser. And it doesn't prevent the attack completely, but um, a lot of the attacks that I was trying, they didn't work really within Reader because you, you get a lot more warnings when you're, when you're in Reader. If it tries to make any connection to the internet, you get a warning. Um, so, you know, if you're just using it to view PDFs, um, there's no real read. There's no real need to have the, the PDF in, embedded in the page. I don't think, anyway. That's my personal opinion. But it's another thing you can do to reduce the likelihood. And that's uh, that's all of the talk. Has anyone got any questions? Yes. Uh, no. I, this is all Windows. I've only I've only played with it on Windows. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's what I was saying before. So, the 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 JavaScript inside the PDF is separate JavaScript engine. Doesn't have access to DOM objects or anything like that. It's completely separate. You used to be able to do with um, uh, the form.submit or any other function that could take a URL. You could put a JavaScript URL in there, and then you could get some JavaScript running. You still don't have access directly, but you could do things like you know you can send some script that then maybe makes an iframe and then makes a request or, or something tricky like that. But yeah, you can't do that anymore. But you can, as I said, you can do it with the FDF. So yeah. Uh, did you report it to Adobe? And secondly, is there any difference between browsers which are using ActiveX? Type plugins and NP API. Um, 
I don't know. I, I, it's, yes, I did report to Adobe, and their response was uh, enable the enhanced security, which is, yep, yeah, it works. You enable the enhanced security, it prevents that. Um, I've tried this in both ActiveX and, and, well, I don't know, but Internet Explorer and Firefox, and both the results are pretty much the same. Uh, it's a little bit more stable in IE. Um, I, again, I think because of the multi-threading or something like that. Any more? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start with the next talk as uh, soon as we set up the, uh, his, his materials and his PowerPoint. So that will give us an estimate of five minutes. We'll see you back here. Thank you.